All right. There we go. There you go. All right. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, welcome, Chris. There's no better person to start the panel discussions with today than Chris Harbert. Just a quick, uh, very brief uh, bio of uh, Chris. So Chris has worked in the ag tech industry here in Champaign for 20 plus years. Upon graduating uh, from the University of Illinois, uh, Chris jumped into the tech industry here, which was the intersection of agriculture, business, science and engineering, and worked for about 20 years. He launched the, he went to work for uh, Waterburn uh, Environmental for about 20 years, launched the, or for about 12 years or so, launched the uh, uh, office here in Champaign, grew that, and then after that went and worked at Agrable and launched Agrable Inc. Uh, and worked there for a few years and grew that uh, company, and then went on to be acquired by Nutrien. For those that aren't familiar with that, that acquisition was one of the largest acquisitions that uh, has ever taken place here in Champaign. So after that, Chris was involved with several startups, invested in them, ran those startups, was involved at the university, and I know he loved what he was doing, so whatever, I, right? I mean, that's right. <laughs> and so I know whatever pulled him away from those had to have been something pretty appealing. And Indigo, what you're doing now, has been called one of the most uh, innovative and disruptive companies in the country. It's been listed as one of the uh, 50 disruptors by CNBC for the past couple of years. So why don't we start by telling us a little bit about what Indigo does. You're the uh, chief strategy officer there in, in over their carbon market. So why don't you start off, because this panel is about how the ag, in, uh, the ag sector is involved with carbon or interacts with carbon markets. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about Indigo, what you do there in carbon markets. Yeah, happy to. You know, big, big picture, I, I drop my youngest son off at school and, and I, as he walks away he says, uh, Save the world today, Dad, or whatever you do on Zoom. You know? <laughs> so, so I think it's it's a mix for me of, of what I'm trying to do there. But but legitimately, you know, uh, what we're trying to do at Indigo overall is is uh, one of the conundrums of of ag tech. You know, being involved in that for many years, all this wonderful technology coming into agriculture, weather technology, modeling technology, aerial imaging, satellite imagery, analysis all with a, with a hope of improving agriculture for, for the farmers um, and, and challenging adoption. You know, I've, I've often said that one of the big challenges in, in ag tech is, is uh, maybe we need to not have accelerators but decelerators because of the long cycle of agriculture to make sure the businesses succeed. Um, but one of the challenges is we're selling savings overall. This model will help you use a little less nitrogen this model will help you if there's a drought. This, this model will do that. And selling savings, we all know that's very difficult, you know, because these little changes, little changes, using a little less nitrogen fertilizer, that's a risk. It's a risk balance for the farmers. You're asking them to take more risk. What we're doing with Indigo is flipping that model around and saying there is an additional product that a farmer can actually participate in a market that markets outside of agriculture, that markets across industry. So there's a structural and economic change coming driven by the IPCC reports and, and the, the global challenge that we're all facing about climate change and climate rise. We're pumping um, all forms of hydrocarbons, solid liquid gas out of the ground and putting it into our very thin atmosphere and really never paying the tax for that overall. And we have an opportunity in agriculture to address that in the near term. And that's really what we're trying to do. We're focused on activating a new market, bringing revenue to agriculture. That revenue drives change that change is largely circled around just the adoption of cover crops and the utilization of photosynthesis and saying that's a technology that we can apply today. That's a technology at scale. There's an industry out there that can deploy photosynthesis across the planet. That's something that we can do today. You know, now we're gonna need all types of things. There are direct air capture methods and you may have heard about these big fan systems that suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and shove it into rocks. I can't wait for that to happen. And we all need that too. But until that comes online, until that industry exists, we need to have uh, agriculture. Agriculture has a role to play if it can get out of its own way and get going quickly. That's the big challenge. There's a short term need or desire to move fast in, in agriculture to say we can at scale address um, some portion of the climate uh, crisis coming as those companies, all companies, change the way in which they do business. Excellent. Thanks for that, uh, that opening. Uh, and, and one thing, I, let me just point out, uh, we'll, do, we'll talk about this for about 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A uh, opportunity for the audience to ask questions. 
And there are QR codes placed around here that you can, you can scan and submit questions. Uh, so a couple of things that you just said there that are interesting to me. You said that farmers can participate, there's opportunities. It seems like there's opportunities for startups, farmers, big companies. Yeah. I may be missing some as well. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and I believe that uh, Bill Hamer from Corteva will be talking a little bit after lunch, so he'll talk a little bit about farmers, but perhaps you could address the opportunities there for farmers, startups, and uh, Yeah, business. absolutely. So, you know, if, if you think of this as a new commodity opportunity being brought to agriculture to say, if a farmer changes their practices slightly, they adopt no-till, they move to a cover crop, they change the nitrogen application, uh, they might put down a microbial, or any new technology that comes out, I like to think of it as like magic dust number 17, and I hope somebody out here is uh, developing that, that you sprinkle on a field and it sequesters more carbon. You know, that, that's an opportunity out there as you, as you can measure and quantify that, um, there's an opportunity in it. So, so as we think about the role that Indigo plays, I'm activating that market and making sure that we have a buyer um, and the producers of the commodity, this, this greenhouse gas sequestration. Um, in order to do that, we have to model it, and we call that quantification, quantification and measurement technology. You gotta think of us as like a transaction element in the, in the middle. We're talking about taking an invisible gas out of the atmosphere and sequestering tons. Does anyone have a feel for what a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent gas is? There's three of them in this room. You know, that's the size of a ton of carbon dioxide gas. You could have three tons in this room, for example. Um, that is a hard thing to communicate to the public. It's a hard thing to communicate to any number of businesses that have complex supply chains that are utilizing, um, you know, different fossil fuels. And it's a hard thing to communicate to farmers that, what, you mean, I can sequester a ton of that per year, per acre? I can't see it but we have to prove to everyone that it actually happened. So that's the role that Indigo's playing. We are, we're activating that market and proving to the buyers, the sellers, and to the public at a high bar with rigorous science, um, literature out there, public open science, that um, this is real. So in that, now there's opportunities for any number of startup companies to say, we've done the studies, we've looked out, we've made a change to a farmer's ground, magic dust number 13, we invented it, we put it out, we trialed it, we can put that into our models and then we can turn around and pay um, farmers for it and have, have companies actually pay for the creation of it. So there's a, there's a revenue generation opportunity coming for your technology. The, the thing that's really important though, and, and back to like farmers and tech companies and what's really important here, um, it has to exist in a digital twin, right? Because you can't see this. Like think about corn. If I'm a, I'm a farmer, I'm doing a corn soy rotation out here, and it's middle of July, and I'm driving around in my pickup truck, and I look at the corn, and the leaves are all cupped. I know it's drought stressed. I might make a decision to say I'm not going to put down an extra fertilizer. I'm, I'm, I'm making sure things are going well here. You can't see what you're doing in terms of, of uh, carbon sequestration. It's, it's invisible, right? So how do we ultimately start to teach farmers how to do better, how to sequester more? We want this to be... Um, performance-based, not just practice-based, where I do a cover crop check. Well, it could be a bad cover crop. It might not even grow. That's not really doing anything for our environment. So the, the, the key is to make it performance-based. Um, but you know, the, the opportunity for us is, is just um, you know, ultimately for those groups to um, think about that digital twin, think about the way that we can represent that benefit that the new technology brings in an electronic world because there is no physical analog to this. It's, a, it's an invisible gas, it's quantified electronically. So the creation of that digital twin, making sure the science is there to actually back up what's happening in the digital twin, the digital twin is what you get paid for, right? So there's a lot of data collection and other things that we have to do to back up that uh, justification for the quality assurance behind um, a successful digital twin. You could even think of it, maybe we're on the verge of something like an augmented reality view of what's happening in a field where you see the corn growing and then you put on VR goggles and you can actually see bubbles of carbon dioxide gas either going down or coming up. We may need technology even to start to help people visualize what's happening and how this uh, commodity is being created. Interesting. Uh, it, so we've got about five minutes and then we'll, we'll go. 
Well, but we'll go to questions after uh, f five more minutes. Uh, any thoughts on how larger companies can get involved in these markets? Yeah, so, you know, one of the, um, the first reactions to this was, wow, this seems like there's a lot of money in this, you know? Mm -hmm. Wow, there's carbon credits all over the place, and, <laughs> and everybody said, well, we want to have a carbon program, and we want to have a carbon program, and it was like an episode of Oprah, you know? We get a new car, and we get a new car, and everybody had a carbon program spinning up, and, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's hard work, you know, and it's a long-term commitment. We're talking about asking a grower to fundamentally change the way they farm, to add no-till. That's a change in equipment. That's a change in culture. It's almost a religious change in some, in some senses of what you're asking uh, a grower to do. Um, adding a cover crop, the risks of that to a business to say, I'm going to add a cover crop and maybe um, not be able to terminate it at the right time and that'll interfere with my primary crop. A lot of, a lot of really challenging things mm -hmm. we're asking them to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. Uh, questions? Have policies or have. I'm going to catch the restroom really quick. That's good. That's what before the big show. I'll be having sure. Yeah. Stirs that are dealing with that. Yeah. Do you see that we also need innovation in the analytics for that data so that it actually, so that we can use it effectively? If it just stays on farm, it's not going to go anywhere. But if we can get it into the insurance policies or into the investment policies, then we actually might be able to move this faster. Oh, How do you absolutely. see we do that, or do you see some uh, gaps where we can fill with new policies or you know things that you're seeing even in the industry? Yeah, no, it's a great question. You know, there it, it is a risk calculus for a farmer. When you think about the biggest risks, it, particularly in the U.S., it's a nearly optimized agriculture. You know, farmers are really good at what they do and really good at what they do on that particular field. The big variable is the weather and and addressing weather. We have multi peril policies and other government insurance vehicles to be able to uh, defer that risk to a certain extent. 85% coverage would be a maximum, for example. There are new policies that are just out. There's uh, one that just hit called PACE, and the PACE policy allows for the delay of nitrogen fertilization from the fall into the spring and reduces the risk of potentially a, a drag on yield, um, giving opportunities for a grower to make a decision to say, okay, well, I can actually get paid for a carbon credit or carbon offset as part of delaying the nitrogen, I'm doing the right thing, and there's actually some insurance and get that risk happening. So there, there's obviously a, a connection there. You know, what, one of the other areas that we see, you know, and, and we've been trying to spin up these programs, concepts of green bonds and other ways that we can get industry to spur the change and get that flywheel effect going so that the grower isn't taking the full burden you know, one of the things I, I like to say is we, we are all kind of responsible for the carbon, um, hydrocarbon use. You know, it's, it's not Shell Oil's fault. It's, it's us. You know, we're using it. Shell Oil wouldn't exist if we didn't buy their products. You know, but you think about what that means, you know, overall in terms of, of, um, of our ability to um, think about um, the, the, the total carbon um, accounting of, of, of what we're doing. It, it's a... It's a way to um, decide or reduce the footprint, and you know any way that we can do in a, in a risk sense to reduce the, um, the the exposure there of a farmer is is a, a very helpful thing. Um, it, there's there's a number of financial things when when we think let's just talk about equipment for example. If there was a piece of equipment that a farmer could buy um, to help them on this journey, high clearance sprayers are one. Um, No-till planters are another. If we had financing for those up front at attractive rates, if the grower promised to do it, and we're already collecting data off those machines, you know, that's one of the outstanding features of modern ag equipment. The data is already being collected. If that could be streamed in, a combination of a reduced cost to acquire a piece of equipment and then a data stream that comes off of it, that's another advantage where ag tech can really play into um, activating this market.
Yeah. You got me, Bill. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, this question comes from Re Rebecca from Hickory Grove Farm. And she said, will farmers who have been using cover crops for years be afforded the same opportunities with carbon credits as those who start using cover crops in response to the market? Yeah. Uh, why or why not? Yeah, it's a great question. And this is, this is one of those classic challenges with the way the rules. So I don't write the rules, right? I'm, I'm executing on the rules as Indigo. The rules are set by those who are buying the carbon offsets. And one of the the three kind of main things that has to happen in a carbon offset. They have to be real and prove that they're real. That's the modeling and everything I talked about before. They have to be additional, which means something new had to happen. You had to change something. It can't just be business as usual. I promise not to light the forest on fire. You know, that's not, that's not good enough. You should plant a new forest. You know, that's, that's the concept of additionality. And then permanence, you know, permanence is that it sticks around because if you undo the change, in the following year, did we really impact the atmosphere long term? So there's that long term uh, need and desire. So when we talk about no-till farmers and um, those who have been doing cover crops for some time, the work that we have today, or those, those tools in our toolbox right now that we can bring, they've already been doing. It's a challenge for them to participate in the straightest, strictest interpretation of a carbon credit program. What we're doing to address that is working within the supply chain. So carbon credits themselves are a standalone piece that has to meet that realness, additionality, and permanence criteria. Those 95% of agriculture are not doing these practices right now. That is targeted at that 95%. For the 5% of farmers that are already doing these practices, they have a leg up, and they're creating actually low carbon commodity crops already. And we can position those with the typical buyers the General Mills and the Post and all the different CPG, consumer packaged brand goods, are desiring those products in their supply chains and they will pay more. They will pay a, a, a premium per bushel for those, those products that come from those farmers who have historically done that. So in our carbon program, no, we cannot actively help both the long-term no-till farmers and the new to no-till farmers, for example. But in our overall program as Indigo, we are absolutely able to handle both of those and welcome those growers into a long-term relationship with us. Great question. One. Chris, I'm wondering a couple of things. One, how do you measure the carbon? I take it that's really hard to do. And what that, what is that standard if there is one? Yeah. And then is it possible to take a suite of things that producers are doing and use that as the way they enter the carbon market as opposed to you're measuring it directly? Uh, and I'm wondering whether how, where the industry is pointed at this time. It looks like it's a little scattershot still. Yeah, you know, there's, there's um, as, as I mentioned before, a lot of new entrants and a lot of groups figuring out that this is really, really hard to do and hard to do well. Um, the, the modeling technology that we use is um, a model called Dacent. It's the Daily Time Step Century model. It comes out of uh, Keith Poshton's lab at Colorado State. There's a 30 plus year publication record. It's his, his entire career of a model. Um, we use that model. Um, a number of other groups use that model as well. That is a greenhouse gas accounting model from, from beginning to end, so it looks at um, carbon dioxide, it looks at nitrous oxides, it looks at methane, it looks at organic carbon, and the gas exchange in the soil plant environment and quantifies that. That is uh, deployed in what we call modeling domains, and those domains have to be rigorously uh, checked through a series of reports that we have to submit around the applicability. And it can't just be that, well, that model works in that area. It has to be researchers have actually done work to show that those particular sequence of practices uh, give an actual outcome that is different from zero. You know, there's a significant change. So the model is used in combination with soil sampling on our program, and that's all backed up, only applicable in areas where there's been great work by the land-grant universities and science in general through time and we're only relying on um, the open literature and published, published works in order to build that, build that confidence. Everything that we have to do has to be open. We have buyers going to their public boards, having to say that they're buying a real offset. 
that realness concept that I talked about, and that requires this, this, uh, this piece together. I think what we, when we think about the groups who are kind of watchdogging this, USDA has talked about coming in and establishing something like an organic standard. It's really not necessary because we have an international groups already called the registries. Climate Action Reserve and VERA are two of them. They already participate and have for the last 20 years in forest trading credit programs. We're following their rule sets. They've established an extremely high bar that we're following in, in all of that rigorous way to make sure that the buyer and the producer know that they're producing something of quality and that that's uh, beyond reproach when it comes under public scrutiny. So, and I'm not sure everyone's doing that. You know, I, th I think that's, that's the challenge. What I'm saying to the world is we've done that. It's possible. We know it's possible and we're open for business. Let's work together. You know, that's the partnership attitude across agriculture that's so important. Excellent. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Over here. Thank you. So one thing I've uh, kind of studied closely is Alberta and, and what happened there with their agricultural carbon markets. And I, I know it's different there because they have a different policy environment, but yeah. uh, one company I spoke with there, um, when this all first kind of started there, they had t 10 companies doing this and, and now three remain. And you mentioned earlier that a, a lot of companies here have gotten into this. So I was wondering um, what's kind of your projection on, on long-term, uh, what's going to happen here? Are we going to see consolidation? Are we going to see uh, some companies change their mind? Uh, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I think, you know, what, what we're going to see overall in terms of, of the market development here, um, just like, uh, let's, let's look at another segment like Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and there's Diners Club and there's a few others, you know, they're, they're, like industries settle in on a number of, of main players. I think we'll see that to some extent, consolidation. The other, the other element at some point, the programs as they get larger, the way the statistics work, you actually generate more credits per acre as a result of the statistical weight of what you're doing at scale. So as the programs get larger, they're going to have an advantage over, over new new upstarts in a sense. So I, I think we'll see a, a few large groups emerge in, in different areas. There's a, there's a local aspect to agriculture that is not to be like swept under the rug. You know, when we're talking about cotton in the south or we're talking about soybeans or wheat out west to the difference between irrigation and not, I think we'll see some regional groups that are, are more um, tailored potentially to that, those different nuances of agriculture emerge. Um, we also know globally if we look um, for areas, we call it carbon prospecting, of where we can go globally and actually start to find more carbon or the ability to produce more carbon, right? That, that prospecting concept. It's not necessarily where you can produce the, the greatest crops. You know, when we get equatorial, the winters are too warm and there's biological activity that decreases the actual effectiveness. So, you know, when we look at a global map of crop production, that's not necessarily a one-to-one -one indication of where carbon programs will emerge. I think we're going to see, you know, a little of that too of like a redefinition and hopefully we're able to show you at some point a map of the globe and where are the best places to actually go and sequester carbon. The U.S. is one of them. Excellent. With that, we're out of time. So let's give uh, a hand to Chris. He'll be around the rest of the day if you want to reach out to him. Thanks, Dad.